Hello everyone. Um, this is my dry color wheel and I was just about to remove it off of my board and then I realized this is a good time to talk about removing tape because if you remove your tape too quickly or too rushed or coming into your image rather than away from your image you can tear which it's not a huge deal when it's your color wheel, but when it's a piece that you've been working on for three or four days, um, or three or four weeks, depending on how detailed it is, it can be heartbreaking if you, um, if you tear any of your paper. So, the rule is low, slow, and away. And um, I'm just gonna show you how I remove my tape, and then I'll tape down a new sheet of paper, and we'll be discussing complementary colors and how to mix them into each other and the relationship between the complements and how they affect each other's color intensity. So, we're just going to remove some tape. Here, I want to take this piece off because it's on top of this one. So I just want to pull at the corner and then I, I, sometimes I stay so far down on my paper that I just remove it back with a little bit from my finger and it's low, slow, and away. So I'm taking it just a little bit at a time and removing it that way and then I'll take this one and I should just be able to remove cleanly out here. Before there was tape, um, and there was good watercolor paper, what people would do is they would soak their paper with um, a big brush and a bunch of water and use clips and stretch their paper. And there's still people that work in that practice, but what's neat is if you ever have a chance to be in a museum and see some old uh, watercolors like from the turn of the century or even before that I just saw um, an Albrecht Durer piece that had been printed in intaglio and then uh, colored with watercolor tinted with watercolor and um, you know that's from 1509 <laughs> So if something's been sitting in a drawer for 500 years in um, a museum space, you might see these little um, like spaces usually on each side in which there's a little bit of white coming through and the rest of the paint will go all the way around or you'll see people just kind of paint sort of in and leave this big border and that's because they've stretched their paper and then clipped to a nice big board. So I just removed my tape and um, here's how my color wheel dried down and I'm really happy with the look of my colors and as you can see every time you do a color wheel they're just slightly different you know you might be able to check your blue greens against each other or your red violets against each other I find that this combination this family over here of yellow yellow orange orange and red orange that sometimes in your tints they're almost imperceptible in um, what colors they are so it's just interesting to see that there's these slight variations you know and oftentimes people are asking me well how do I know that this is red violet and you can get a store-bought color wheel like this right and you can test it against okay that's my red violet okay that's my red violet and watercolor and see them side by side but you can also just ask yourself if this is my violet is this more red than it is violet? And is it more violet than it is red? It, you just want it to be that half step, right? So those tertiary or intermediate colors are just half steps in between a primary and a secondary. And then today what we're gonna look at is this right here. So um, we're gonna take the three main combinations of complementary colors and um, we're going to mix them basically into each other. So I'm gonna set up three rows. Uh, this one has seven columns within it. As long as you have an odd number, you're gonna be in a good place because you want this center column to be your neutral column. And basically with complements, you find them across from each other on the color wheel. So our, our primary complements are red and green, right? There's red and then there's the mix of the other two primaries, shump, that make green. And they're basically, you can kind of think of them as each other's opposites. 
They make each other as bright as possible when they sit next to each other and they dull each other to neutral as they mix so that you can get these combinations that are no more red than they are green and no more green than they are red. These really neutral brown grays in the center. So you can see the other combinations here are orange blue right on the color wheel you can see here's red orange right let's take a little step over here's orange orange and blue directly across from each other on the color wheel yellow and violet directly across from each other on the color wheel and again remember that if you're ever like what's yellow's complement and you're not looking at a color wheel just think about those other two primaries you mix blue and red together and you get violet boom right they are each other's counterpoints um, so you can kind of think of them as like a, a yin and yang that one can't exist without the other. Um, sometimes I think of them as like an old pair of best friends or an old married couple. You know, they know how to build each other up. They know how to make each other shine when they sit right next to each other. But they also know like exactly the thing to uh, say to knock you down and neutralize you. And this is really important to know this relationship of your compliments because a lot of the world is dull, right? So you also need to think about color intensity, bright versus dull, in order to control and um, manipulate your composition, right? As you are composing a piece, if you want something to come forward and you have a really bright green already in the foreground, you can place a red right next to it, a pink or a red, and it'll bring that green forward even more. And if you need to knock something down, you know, if you have a strawberry in your foreground that has some really deep shadows in it and you need to knock those reds down, you can mix some green into your red. So like, as you can see here, this is red, with just a little bit of green in it. And then we mix a little bit more green and then a little bit more. And then over here, we're gonna start with green and we're gonna mix a little bit of red and a little bit more red until we get to here. And so we're gonna have these really, um, nice neutral gray browns in here and it really depends on the pigments that you start with what these neutrals end up looking like and you can see here I must have been working with a different set um, so these are just slightly different and you can see some separation here in my orange and blue that happens often um, and I'll talk about that uh, if it happens today or if the possibility of it is going to happen in your piece and here again is the color wheel that we worked on yesterday. I'm just gonna set all of these out of the way for a second. And I'm gonna get a brand new sheet of paper. Again today, I'm working on the Hot Press. And it's by Arches, 140 pound. 140 pound is just my favorite for doing these um, like quick little introductory assignments. And um, if, if you bought paper that's not 100% cotton, that's okay. It's not a big deal. Here, I'm just going to set this down. I'm taping down. Remember, I want to be a little bit on my paper and a little bit off. And I use my thumbs to stretch out my tape. And set this where I want it to be. If you have a paper that you're working on that has more texture on one side and less texture on the other, use the side that has more texture. That is technically the front. It's mimicking a cold press watercolor paper. Okay, there we go. And I'm gonna keep using the palette that we used before, which is just this little 10 well palette, super cheap and easy. And I'm going to continue using this Yarka set as well, just so I can be consistent with um, the colors that I'm using between my color wheel and then also this setup. I've just put my brushes in my water. You should not store your brushes in your water overnight. Make sure that you're cleaning them off and then letting them store either laying flat or vertically so that they're not resting on their bristles. Um, especially if you've invested in a good brush, like this is my fancy brush. Um, this is a number eight Windsor & Newton Series 7 Finest Sable. This was hand tied in England. Uh, Windsor & Newton makes some of the best watercolor supplies in the world and they have been doing so for um, over a hundred years. 
I love this brush. I think of it as like my wand. Um, if you're a Harry Potter lover, it like came in a little box. I'll, I'll show you the box at some point in time. And it just felt like going to Ollivander's and getting your, uh, your very own brush, your very own wand that fits you perfectly. <laughs> um, this is just like, it's such a beautiful brush and it's so well weighted and it holds so much water. I don't use it for these types of practices because I need to work small and this is such a, a big surface area here. I can make really tiny marks in here, but um, it takes up a lot of space and uh, I like to use number six or number four to do this smaller work. I'm gonna make my ruler here and I'm using a 2B pencil right now. This doesn't need to be perfect. I'm actually just gonna trace both sides of the ruler, right? So here's one, and let's separate these a little bit. And I'm gonna make another one here. And then one more, let's say right about here. That looks good. I'm just gonna move my palette for a second and on the other side. And then I'm gonna come to the middle. You don't need to measure this. You can just make it, you know, close. So I'm gonna come right down the line here and then out from this side. And then I'm gonna eyeball the center. So I'm guessing that that's about the center over on this side and make that here. And then I'll split these in half. So my sections out to the side will be a little bit bigger than my sections that are in that neutral center, but that's okay. If you love measuring and being perfect, you just want to have an odd number of columns within your three rows. And if you've never mixed your complements before, this is such great practice. And this is also another good way to get to know your set. So if you have a new watercolor set, this is it's just a good place to be. So we're gonna go in uh, rainbow order here. So we're gonna have red over here, and then orange, and then yellow. These are our warm colors, right? These have a warm temperature, like fire. And then over here, we're going to have green and blue and violet or purple. These are our cool colors. And when we're dealing with our complements, so here's our complementary colors. Then uh, we want to think about color intensity. So I'm going to write that down here as well. So. We're looking at color intensity, not value, but intensity. And intensity has to deal with dull versus bright. Whereas value has to do with light and dark. So you can have dull light colors and dull dark colors and bright light colors and bright dark colors. Um, so remember that color intensity is not equivalent to color value and that there is a big difference between dull and bright and light and dark. Um, so we're dealing with color intensity here and we're striving for a neutral right here in the middle. Okay, so basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with red over here and then we're gonna add a little bit of green and a little bit more green and try and get to this neutral by adding, in theory, equal parts of green. And then we're gonna do the same thing over here. We're gonna start with green, add a little bit of red, add a little bit more red, and end up right here in the middle. And the idea of these neutral colors is that they are no more red than they are green, no more orange than they are blue, no more yellow than they are violet, that they're nice and neutral and brown right in the middle. So let's see if we can do that. So I have my number six here. And I'm just gonna start with my red. I'm just gonna put a little bit of water here in my palette and pick up a little bit of red and move it over. Nice and fluid. And I'm just gonna make my fence. Oop, I want that a little bit more red. Just gonna make my fence here and fill that in. There we go. And if you ever lay down a color and you want it to be a little bit more saturated, you can just drop a little bit more color in there. And I'm gonna use my pre-made 
green. So now you guys can see this green for the first time. Um, so I'm just gonna take a little bit of water, pick up a little bit of green. I'm never pushing hard over here. I'm just, I'm just running my brush over the top in circles just to activate that color and bring it over into my well here. And I don't want a ton of that color, right? I just want a little bit. So I'm just gonna pull a tiny bit over into this space. And that looks good. So I'm gonna take that small amount and put it into my red. And that's perfect. That's like a red that's just one step away from the red that we laid down here. It's just got, it's just a little bit dull. It's still very much red, right? But it's got a little tiny bit of green in it. And if you're like, hey, I think that's kind of a bigger step than I want it to be, you can always put a little bit more red back in. So you can go back and forth here, you know? So if you're like, I just want a little bit more red in there before I get quite to that level. And then we're gonna take a little bit more green. So we'll just take a little bit more of this green and mix it in here. Remember green has a very weak color, right? Yellow, and then a very strong color, blue mixed together. And I want this still to be a little bit more red. There we go. Nice dull red, still on the red side. I would qualify as that as a dull red and not necessarily like a true brown, and I definitely wouldn't call it a green. So I'm just gonna put that in there. And then I'm gonna go from the other direction and save the middle. So now I'm gonna take a small amount of red, and this already has green in it, so it's okay, right, to make that jump. Oh, I didn't lay down my green. So let's lay down my true hue first. So I'm gonna pick up a little bit of my green here that's untouched by red. Boom, boom, boom. Set that down, fill it in. Remember, you're just dropping your color on. You're never smushing it on there, you're never scrubbing it on there. And this just has a little bit of red in it. This is a small step right here where you can see that that's just like a little tiny bit of red mixed in with our green. Let's do just a slightly bigger step. So I just put a little bit more of my red in there. Okay, now I'm going to take a little bit more of this and mix it in. I feel like that's still on the green side. There we go. So we have this nice, really dull green. It's just red and green, right? And remember that these are all combinations of our primaries. And now we're going to try and get to that middle, right? So that it's not red or green. Set that down. All right, so I can just take what I have left and kind of mix them together until I feel like I get a color that's not green or red, that it's this real neutral gray-brown in between the two of them. So let's see. This looks pretty good. I feel like it's still leaning a little bit green, so I'm gonna pick up a tiny bit more red and put it in there. And let's see if we can get it even more neutral. Oh yeah, there we go. So there's my three primaries all mixed together, right? Red, and then the yellow and blue of green. So I have this really nice combination between the two of them. Green and red happen so naturally, so often, right? So I mentioned a strawberry, but if you think about watermelons and cherries and all different kinds of fruits and flowers, we have all of these um, beautiful hollyhocks in bloom in our neighborhood right now. Um, and the reds and greens in combination with each other and roses and all sorts of beautiful things. You're gonna use red and green to dull and brighten each other uh, if you're painting from life, especially if you're painting nature Whew, all the time. Okay, let's do our orange. So again, this is the first time that you've seen this true orange and I'm just gonna pick it up, move it into my palette here. It's a great, really bright orange. And I'm just gonna set that down here, make my little fence, and then fill it in. Remember, you're just dropping your color on. All of these, you know, trial exercises are such a good way for you to get used to your materials. So if you're having real trouble 
and you're like, okay, every time I see you pick up your color, it's just so much more saturated than mine is. It's just about the ratio between the water and the pigment. So you wanna get it to this like really juicy combination here where it's nice and fluid and it's moving and you have enough color and enough water that it's not sticky, right? If it's not diluted enough and it's too heavily saturated, it's gonna be really sticky because you're gonna get all this pigment and gum arabic that hasn't been um, broken down with the water and then if it's way too much water right you can always make it darker so I always tell my students there's no such thing as too much water because you can always do a second pass of pigment over the top but if you have too much pigment and you have way too much saturation not enough water you're gonna get a glassy layer of gum arabic on the top of your paints that's gonna dry to the top instead of settling down into the paper where that binder should be right binding your pigment to the paper um, and it's gonna be kind of shiny and gross and I ne I'm never looking for that in my imagery right and sometimes I'll oversaturate an area and I'll put way too much pigment um, in a section especially when I'm building up darks and I'll get this little bit of gum arabic that comes to the top and I'm like oh I don't want that and then don't worry though you know you can you can change your ways. Um, I'm just taking the tiniest bit of blue and mixing it with my orange. Remember my blue is so strong, so, so strong. And so I've made way too big of a jump here, I feel like in my orange. Let's back it up just slightly. So I'm just gonna put a little bit more orange in here. Beautiful. Pick that up, move it over here. Make this nice fence here, fill it in. Maybe pick up a little bit more pigment and drop it in there, great. Okay, now I'm gonna take a little bit more blue and bring it over here. And that blue has more water in it than this does, and so it's gonna just um, change the orange with less intensity, right? It's gonna have um, a more saturated, is that a big enough jump? Let's go slightly more. Let's pick up a little bit more blue and just mix that in, a little bit more blue. That's still very orange, there we go, nice. All right, there we go. Orange and blue, is it my favorite? I don't know. I feel like I'm guilty of saying that each combination is my favorite depending on the day of the week. I do use yellow and violet a lot, but I have such a soft spot for blue and orange and it's so wonderful to work with blue and orange. Um, if you're a bird, birder the American kestrel that lives here in Arizona is a wonderful combination of blue and orange and I love painting and drawing them oh that's a huge jump okay let's take a little bit more blue bring it back in here we want it to be dull but not that dull Ooh, there we go and when we're painting our skies later on we're gonna be using orange to dull our blue because even though we love that like bright bright blue in our skies Sometimes we do have to tone it down just a little tiny bit. So these compliments get used in all different kinds of ways in order to control the intensity of the colors that you're working with. Okay, I'm gonna grab a little bit more orange. That's way too much. Pull some of it off, drop this in the blue. Oh, we're so close to a neutral color there. Let's pull a little bit of blue back in. At this moment, you might be thinking, Oh, she's done this a ton of times and she's still having a little bit of trouble. Watercolor is so temperamental in the sense that it can really go back and forth <laughs> where, um, you know, a color's too orange, a color's too blue, a color's too orange, a color's too blue, and you have to put a little bit more blue in there and then a little bit more orange in there. And especially when you're working with anything that's got yellow in it, right? It's, um, it's gonna set you up for uh, overpowering right just having way too much of a stronger color in there look at this this looks super neutral Ooh, I would not call that orange or blue I'm so pleased with how how neutral these are coming out like these are very much almost gray like true grays mixing them together which um, to me just means that they're like perfectly balanced as compliments, just seeing 
this green in temperature to that red, right? And this blue with its temperature in regards to that orange. That they're just, they're look at, they're just neutralizing each other. They're kind of taking all of each other's color away. Um, and that's so impressive. And this is such a, a great way to see your colors just squash each other. Okay, I'm gonna turn my palette really quickly. Um, clean my brush, because I'm going into my yellow, so I don't want anything else on there. And I've even made a little drop on my yellow, and I just want to make sure that all I'm getting is this yellow when I move it over. And I can clean that little drop off with just some water and a paper towel. Some people's yellows, my yellow often is disgusting. <laughs> it's so difficult to keep your yellow beautiful and clean. Um, so just start a good practice of cleaning your brush keeping those paper towels close by. Okay, so here's the yellow. So this is just yellow by itself. Really beautiful, medium yellow. It's not going too cold or too warm. It's just, mm, it's a nice middle yellow. And then I'm gonna pull a little bit of violet. So I'm gonna pick this pre-made violet. And remember this violet is like super grapey. It's like, not like real grape, but like Crayola grape marker. Um, this is not what I would call a desirable violet in regards to just using on its own, but when mixed with a small amount of red or a little bit of blue or a little bit of orange or a little bit of yellow, you know, if you're willing to just tint it slightly, you're gonna get this really, really beautiful violet. But here, look at this, this is like, straight out the box. That is a wild color. Ugh. Garish. Garish purple over here. Okay. So that guy is so strong and this guy is so weak. So we want to just be really cautious. I'm going to take most of this off over here and I'm just going to put the little spit and it's still going to be too much. I know it's going to be too much. So I'm just going to mix it in there. Look at that. Even with that littlest bit of violet, it just killed my yellow, right? It just killed it. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to clean our brush. We're gonna drop that brush on a paper towel. I'm not sure you guys can see this paper towel. So I'm just gonna take my paper towel and really make sure that I don't have any of that purple left on my brush. Okay, I'm good. So I'm gonna come back to my yellow and I'm just really gonna load it up. See how I'm loading it up on my brush? I'm just moving in these little circles and it's filling my brush, right? And now I'm gonna come back to here. Oh yeah, okay, wonderful. All right, I feel like that's maybe a second step. Let's see if we can go even further back. So we're gonna take a little bit more yellow. <clears throat> Remember when I said, start with your weaker color? <laughs> and so that you don't go too far, like I just did, make sure that you really have enough of that yellow set up and that you just have the tiniest bit of violet when you get started, okay. Oh, this is such a good dull yellow. So you just fill in that dull yellow. That's our first step there. And then I'm gonna just put a little bit more water in here and I'm gonna just take the tiniest bit. Look, I'm just gonna pull a little bit of violet from over here, whatever's over here, and bring it in here. And it's not quite enough, but it's so close. So I'm gonna come back over here. And now I just have tiny bits of violet that I'm dealing with. And look at how that blue in that violet is turning this kind of green. It's really interesting. If you have a really warm violet, you'll get these really lovely ochres, these yellow ochres, which are very handy colors when you're working with watercolor because they're already a perfect combination of your primaries, so they'll dull anything. So you can add ochre to red and it'll dull it, but it'll head more orange because it's still got more yellow. And you can add a yellow ochre to blue and it will dull it, but it'll head a little bit towards green. And then you can add it to your violet and it'll like perfectly neutralize it. And it's so wonderful when you get a really good ochre. Um, this is like I feel like as this dries up, it is gonna look kind of like this dull yellow green, almost like when we mixed our black with our green, which just means that this violet has way more blue in it than I thought it did. So, 
um, that's how I'm thinking about colors, right? Is, is that breakdown there. All right, so now we have to go the other way. So we have to put our yellow into our violet. We can use the yellow that already has violet in it. So we can take that step. Oh my goodness, these colors are really, truly each other's opposites. So amazing. I don't know if I've ever actually done this complimentary color duo with this set, which is funny because um, I have been using this set in class, but maybe I've just been having my students use this set and I haven't been using it. That's poor practice right there. Oh, it's so interesting. Look at this violet. Look at how much more beautiful this violet is. And it's not so crazy and bright. Um, so this, right, just has the littlest bit of yellow in it. And then I'm going to take a little bit more. We're going to try and knock it down, but still keep it on the purple side. Can we keep it on the purple side? Is that too big of a step? I think that's too big of a step. Let's bring a little bit more purple out here. Violet. I just said purple so many times, that's funny. I almost never do. Okay, here we go. There we go, that's still violet, right? That's still a violet or a purple, but it's really dulled down. It's got quite a bit of yellow in it. And now we're gonna try and find that baseline neutral color right in between them. So, this is too yellow, that's too violet. Just gonna mix them together until we get this really great color. It's not yellow and it's not violet. Mm -hmm -hmm. In theory, they would be like 50%, right? But it never really works out that way, especially because yellow is always in the mix, right? How's this look? I think that still looks too yellow. How's this one look? Mm, I think that's more neutral. You might be having a moment where you're like, is there a difference between those two colors? Is she crazy? I don't see a difference between those two colors. But we mixed them together, and now there is no difference between those two colors. They are one. All right, here is my compliments all set up. So let's grab another set where you can see the different kinds of yellows here. So right here, you can see this... These neutrals go way more brown than these do. Even as these dry up and are gonna be lighter than they are right here, like this right here is almost like a slate gray. So these, um, this combination of blue and orange, they're just like perfectly balanced to each other. They're really taking all of each other's pigment out, right? So all of that orange is crushing the blue and vice versa. Here you can see that I have an orange and blue that have what are called different, um, I'm sorry, opposing rates of flocculation, which basically means that when the pigment and the binder break apart and that the binder locks it down to the paper, that that happens at a different time interval between this blue and this orange, which is caused basically by different manufacturers or different amounts of gum arabic or two different batches of gum arabic or two pigments that on the chemical level just dry at different times, right? They Or they flocculate, I should say, at different times. And so you get this happening here. And some people just adore this. And I'm one of those people I love when my orange and my blue, they mix, but they don't really truly mix. Even in here, I don't know if you can see it, you can see a little bit of orange still trying to come to the top. And in here, a little bit of blue settling. Um, and these were all, you know, they were one solid color before they dried up, so. It's really interesting. This here, understanding color intensity, knowing that if you have to dull a blue, you have to add orange, knowing that if you need to dull a violet, you have to add yellow. This is super important. So really work on this relationship in your mind, especially when you're looking at browns and naturally occurring dull colors. Just start to ask yourself, you know, how would I mix that color? Um, is that brown leaning more towards red? So, okay, if I would define it as a red brown, then I would come over here to my reds and my greens and I would think, okay, I don't, I want it to be somewhere in between these two. I don't want it to be this crazy gray, but I, I want it to be a brown that's got a little bit more red in it. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of green and I'll work that. And then remember that it's just these three colors, right? It's just red, yellow, and blue. 
that are your primaries that make all of your other colors and that this is just a different percentage of each primary in combination with one another. Okay, so we're, we're always talking about the primaries. And if we go back to our color wheel here that we made yesterday, um, or maybe it was earlier today for you, who knows, um, <laughs> or five weeks ago, <laughs> These aren't the only three complements. This is just the primary, secondary, complementary setup. Every color has a complement. So yellow green's complement is red violet, right? Because green's complement is red and yellow's complement is violet. And so these tertiary steps are those half steps in between those two colors. And you can also do what are called split complementary compositions uh, where you come down the line. So if I'm looking at red, and I bop over to green, its split complements are blue green and yellow green, right? It's just those tertiary colors on either side of the true complement. Uh, so if you ever hear anybody talking about split complementary color schemes, that's what they are discussing. And then the other thing to think about is like, you are describing the color, right? How it looks to your eyes. So if this is your yellow green, and you want to mix its complement, it doesn't have to be perfectly this red violet. It just needs to be a red violet that will cancel out this yellow green. Um, so that if your celery stock that you're painting has this sort of yellow green as its base, then you know that you can mix a red violet and use it for all the shadows in order to create this really great dull shadow relationship between your bright yellow green and your nice dulled down red violet yellow green combo. Okay, and that's really what we're talking about is identifying that, that color that you're gonna use while you're painting other objects and how you're going to consciously manipulate and, and change the composition, right? And manipulate your paints in order to get the light and dark that you want and the bright and the dull that you want. So remember these compliments are talking about color intensity, bright versus dull, dull versus bright. And you can see that here, they're super bright on the outside and really nice and dull on the inside. Um, if you give this a go and it does not go well, <laughs> <laughs> don't feel badly if you take some backwards steps don't worry about it um, this is a practice that takes a little bit of time and it never comes quite easily you could see me mixing here and I'm mixing and remixing colors so um, if you need a couple sheets of paper to do this or you want to work vertically and set up more than just these three lines like you're like okay Corinne I know I'm not gonna get this on the first try I'm gonna set up um, you know six or nine lines and just try it over and over and over again or if you're like okay I love this this is really great for me to think about neutralizing and color intensity go through and just um, do the other color combinations so you have three primary secondaries that are you know pairs which we have right here right and then you have another three which are the intermediate or tertiary so red orange and blue green are complements yellow orange and blue violet are complements yellow green and red violet are complements and you can just go through and mix those if you're on a roll and you want to keep um, mixing complements because it's so much fun right um, or if you want to try a different set if you have two sets of watercolor um, you can always see how they mix together and uh, you might find that an orange from one set mixed better with a blue from another set which is tricky but it's always good to know all right I hope you enjoyed this thank you guys so much for your time um, I really appreciate everybody who's watching these videos you're helping me out so much I love your feedback and um, I can't wait to possibly meet you in person <laughs> or zoom with you and see what you're working on okay Take care.